Welcome back. For most of this series, I will put the army organization part at the end of each of the videos, but this time I will dedicate an entire video to it so that I can explain all of its nooks and crannies in a way that befits a strategy guide. So let's begin my description of the army organization screen by exiting it entirely and looking at the battle map instead. For starters, after each battle, you will see this report on enemy correspondence based on the results of the previous stage. It will almost always include a letter like this, which states that the other side is sending more troops or supplies to fight you. And to explain what that means, I need to describe this box. It shows the expected size of the opposing army, its level of training, and its availability of equipment for the next fight. The right two numbers are pretty self-evident, and in addition to being affected by battle casualties, they can also be further influenced by side battle-specific bonuses which I can't show just yet, but I'll have an example of that to show you after I complete the next stage. The number on the left is the expected enemy army size. The number changes after every battle in the game. It will go up by the amount that you saw in the telegram, but also come down based on how many troops you eliminated in the previous stage. Two things of note, however. First, while the more troops you take down, the more this number goes down, it is not a one-to-one -one ratio. If you kill exactly 10,000 troops, this number will not drop by exactly 10,000. Second, this value always has a minimum, and that minimum changes over time. So it is impossible for you to actually cause so much damage that the enemy will have no army left. Strategically speaking, it is a good long-term plan to do as much damage to the enemy as possible, but it is also important that your own army takes as little damage as possible, as replacing men and materials is expensive. A good rule of thumb is, if you already have a stage's objectives complete, and are wondering whether you should continue to be aggressive, try to figure out if you can do at least twice as much damage to the enemy as you are going to take in return. If so, then continue to press the attack to reduce the enemy in future fights, as well as capture some of their equipment. If not, then prepare your lines defensively, and just let the clock run out. And this is one of the first major differences between this playthrough's difficulty setting and the higher ones. That 2 to 1 judgment call is for Brigadier General difficulty. If you are playing on Legendary, then it's often much better to favor the preservation of your own troops. Back to the army screen. Let's begin with the career tab. There are seven skills you can choose to improve as your player character gains experience through battles. I'll describe each of them, but if you want to see what bonus you'd get for each additional point in your own game, you can always hover the mouse over the Add Point button. First is Politics. Every point in this skill will increase the amount of money and recruits that are added to your pool per stage. Second is Economy. Every point in this skill will reduce the cost of weapons and officers that you purchase. It synergizes well with Politics, but remember that you don't have to pay for any weapon you recover from the battlefield. So if you are on the fence about spending a point here, or one in politics, think if you're capturing large quantities of gear per stage. You might find having the raw cash to be more useful than reduced weapon prices. Third is medicine. Each point in this skill will allow a small portion of your side's casualties to be returned to you after a stage ends. As the battles get larger, this skill gets quite useful, even at its apparently small absolute value. Fourth is training. When you are adding troops to a brigade, you can choose whether to add veterans or rookies. Adding rookies will cause a unit's experience bar to come down. On the other hand, rookies are usually free, though you might still have to pay for their weapon if you don't have spares, whereas adding veterans to a unit costs money. The higher the level of the unit, the more it costs to add veterans to it. This skill reduces that cost. If you start fielding two or three star units, veteran replacements can become quite expensive and this helps to offset that. Fifth is Army Organization. Adding points here will increase the number of corps you're allowed to field, the number of divisions you may have per corps, the number of brigades you may have per division, and the number of soldiers you may have per brigade. You will absolutely be needing larger armies as the game progresses, and this is how you unlock them. Sixth is Logistics. Every point in here allows your units to carry more ammunition with them. The penalty for a unit that runs out of ammunition in the field is that their fire rate is cut to about one-third normal. While obviously this decision was for game balance purposes rather than real-world physics, as a cannon without ammo can't really fire at all, 
Having a unit of yours losing more than half of its damage potential is still bad. It's rather hard to quantify this bonus, however, as the cost of supplying a unit depends on a number of factors. Generally speaking, this skill is more useful as you increase the number and size of your cannon batteries, as they tend to be the real supply hogs of the game. Lastly, Reconnaissance. This skill allows you to get additional enemy information based on how many points you put into it. However, unlike all of the other skills, which give actual bonuses to you, this just gives you more information. The enemy army's size, statistics, etc. are not determined by this value, this just tells you more details about the numbers. For this reason, many players, myself included, tend to largely skip this skill. In real life, knowing exactly how much your opponent brings to the table is very useful in planning, but in this game, you don't get to choose when or where your battles take place. So whether the enemy has 10,000 or 100,000 troops, you're still going to be engaging them and on the same battlefield. And it's always possible to learn the enemy's exact numbers by starting a stage with a suicide charge, pausing, counting what you see, and then reloading the stage. And if that sounds a bit scummy to anyone out there, I'd remind you that you are watching a walkthrough. However, I did rush the recon skill to 4 points at the start of the campaign. Let me fade to a part of the last battle real fast. You will notice at the top of the screen a blue-red bar, which if I mouse over it gives me some rough estimates of the enemy numbers. If you have less than 4 points in recon, this bar is just solid silver and shows nothing. While it may be the case that knowing enemy dispositions pre-fight won't change how the game plays out any, Having estimates mid-battle can be quite useful for determining your plan as the stage progresses. But there is also one more piece of information that this bar gives you as a side effect. If you ever notice a huge jump, indicated by the bar suddenly sliding towards the red or blue side, that means a group of reinforcements has just entered the map. That bit of data is incredibly useful. While you'd probably notice in the minimap if your own side just had a bunch of new units show up, Having this information given to you about the opposition can easily save you from making horrible mistakes. It doesn't matter how thoroughly you've cleared a map. If that bar jumps, then you know that some place where there didn't used to be enemy troops, now there is. Take care with your maneuvers. Personally, when it comes to these leader skills, I get recon up to 4 immediately, and then ignore it for the rest of the campaign. Politics and economy I focus on early, medicine and training during the mid-game, logistics more towards the end, and army organization I add points to on an as-needed basis. As in, if I need another division per corps for the next battle, then that's the stage where I'll take the point. So, plop the career point I got for the first stage into politics, and let's move on. Note that if you do plan on putting a point into training or economy, do so before you start replenishing your army, otherwise it's just money wasted. Next, the barracks tab. It's here where you see the status of any unassigned officer, as well as who is available to be recruited. Certain units require certain minimum levels to be filled. The lowest officer type, Captain, can only lead artillery and skirmishers. Major is required for infantry and cavalry. Colonel is required to lead a division. And Brigadier General is required to lead a corps. Note that there is no actual ranked chain of command in this game. It's entirely possible to have a Brigadier General leading a corps, with a division led by a Colonel, and then have each unit in the division led by a Major General. Why you might want to do this is that the leader of an individual unit applies his own experience as a bonus to that unit. Of course, it also puts that leader at far more risk of being injured or killed when he is at the front line like that, but... Well, that's your personal choice. I'll go over it in more detail in the Army screen. A good rule of thumb is, for the first half dozen stages at least, always hire every general or colonel you can, just to get their extra experience available to your units. After the first half dozen stages, continue to buy up every general that shows up, but save the buying of other officers only for when you have a spot to put them in. Now, the Armory tab. Here you can see how many weapons you have spare, as well as what ones are available to purchase for each of the four unit types. Note that, if you want to make a unit from guns you need to buy first, you don't actually have to come to this screen. You can just choose the weapon in the Army tab, and it will tell you there what the cost of making or reinforcing a unit will be, which I'll demonstrate in a bit. There are two main reasons to come to this screen. One is to purchase rare weaponry, 
After each stage, I recommend coming to this screen just to see if something is available that you want. The other reason is to come here to sell off guns that you may no longer have a need for should cash become an issue. Also, you can mouse over any given weapon to get statistics on it. A full, in-depth discussion of all the weapon types is well beyond the scope of this guide, but such studies have been done by the Soldier, Panda Kraut, and others. I added links back in the first video to their findings, and will add them to this video's description section too. So if you want to compare weaponry on the fly, I recommend heading to those resources. That said, I will make a few comparisons over this series as they become relevant, starting with this one. These four guns have crazy high damage, amazing melee stats, and decent fire rates, but accuracy ratings only slightly better than trying to throw the bullets by hand. Generally, these four should only be used in the extreme early game when you have nothing better yet, for cheap units, or for units that are expressly designed to fight in incredibly close quarters, up to and including melee charges. And with the other tabs out of the way, the meat and potatoes of this part of the game, the army screen. This video will be about the mechanics. More in-depth strategy talks will come as I open up the army slots to demonstrate them. This screen is your total army's order of battle. On the left is your list of cores, though I only have the one at this time. In the center is your divisions, with each division broken up into brigades. As of right now, I only have the one division, though I am allowed to create a second if desired, as well as three brigades, all of which are in much pain after that first fight. In the top right is the funding and fresh manpower I have available to me to replenish the army, and next to that is my reputation. Reputation is on a scale of 1 to 100. Technically it's on a scale of 0 to 100, but if you ever hit 0, you lose the campaign, so don't do that. At the moment, I only have 28, which isn't enough for any bonuses to my army. In addition to army bonuses, you can also spend your reputation. You can spend your reputation all the way down to 20 if desired to purchase things for your army. Seen here, I can pick up three potential items. 2,000 semi-scrubby Springfield 1842 muskets, 2,000 1841 Mississippis, which are actually pretty good at this point, or a new officer, Brigadier General Archer. I'll come back to this in a bit. Each corps also has its own supply wagon that will follow it into battle. You have to pay for the supply out of pocket, but the good news is, at the end of a battle, whatever the wagon started at, it will get automatically refilled to for free. So basically, you only need to pay for a wagon once. You might also have to pay to refill it in mid-battle, but I'll get more into that when it actually happens. How much cost it actually takes to supply a unit in the field is a bit harder to determine, though I will say that sniper-style skirmishers, and especially cannons, are the major culprits when it comes to supply drain. As for the combat units themselves, let me pick the only unit that still seems in one piece here. Each unit has one of four major types, infantry, skirmishers, cavalry, or artillery, as well as having several statistics. I'll go from the bottom up. These statistics are melee. Melee levels up as the unit inflicts melee kills. The higher the level, the stronger in hand-to-hand -hand combat. All very self-explanatory, probably not the biggest concern for cannons. Firearms. Firearms levels up when shooting at targets and enhances the unit's accuracy. At least that's what the tooltip says, but this is one of the reasons I like making these guides, to clear up erroneous information. This is not correct. Firearms goes up as a unit finishes a reloading cycle. While that may sound like I'm chopping rabbits, I... What? Really? Sorry, sound like I'm splitting hairs. It's an important distinction because that can only happen technically after it finishes firing. So if you have a unit that has suffered a morale failure and keeps inefficiently firing at will, it will only get a pittance of firearms training. Stamina. Stamina levels up by marching in the battlefield and helps to keep condition high while fighting. Condition directly affects morale, melee, and marching speed of the unit during combat. Charge is not possible for units with low condition. All true, and with a caveat that, if you want to train your unit's stamina, the best way to do it is, after you successfully secured a battle, but before the timer runs out, have every single unit you can spare just start marching around the map aimlessly. I assure you that was a very common tactic in the real Civil War. Morale. 
This rating determines morale regeneration speed and endurance to combat shocks. Efficiency and melee strength become lower when morale decreases. Morale levels up according to battle hours and can be affected positively or negatively by your reputation as a general. By according to battle hours, it just means that if a unit is present on the battlefield, they will slowly be gaining points towards their maximum morale rating. Another good reason to sometimes draw out battles. Efficiency. Efficiency levels up by making kills and directly improves shooting, reload speed, and melee strength. The largest possible efficiency is achieved according to the command level of the unit. Possibly the most important stat a unit has, as well as one of the hardest to train, since it's a sort of cyclical function. The better your efficiency, the better you are when shooting, which gets you more kills, which raises your efficiency faster. This stat is the reason you really don't want to suffer major casualties on your more highly trained units. And lastly, command. I'm going to skip reading the in-game tooltip as I tend to find it a bit misleading. What it's important to know when deciding who will lead any given unit in this game is that the efficiency of a unit may be tied to its experience, but no matter how experienced the unit is, if the command structure above it isn't experienced enough, then some of that efficiency will be lost. However, the confusing part is that, while the command rating is determined by the unit in charge of the brigade, with a small bonus applied by the leader in charge of the division, the actual number being shown here is not related to the efficiency rating. Like, at all. The command value is applied to the size of the brigade, following an equation that I don't have the full data for, and then, if it is determined that the command rating is too small, the efficiency rating will be brought down by some amount. Okay, maybe that wasn't much less confusing. Let me just put it this way. This number and this number are completely unrelated, and this number is almost meaningless to pay attention to. When deciding on leaders, just keep an eye on the efficiency rating. If you assign a guy and this number drops, or if you start sliding in replacement troops and the number starts slipping, then you have passed the current officer's command capability. Either stick to a smaller brigade, replace the leaders, or deal with the penalty until more experience is gained. Also in the detail window for the unit is the weapon that they are using, which you can click on if you wish to change or see the cost of changing, the current leader, his rank, his experience within that rank, and the overall experience of the unit itself. Every time this bar reaches full, the unit will gain a choice of a new perk. You may have noticed that the unit statistics have a gray bar, followed by another bar that is either red or lighter gray. The dark gray bar is the unit's raw statistics. After it, the lighter gray bar is the unit's current statistics, as modified by their experience, which is itself modified by their commander's rank and the commander's experience within the rank, as well as, occasionally, other factors. Or, in the case of severely oversized and under-officered units, a red bar denoting an overall penalty. Though again, this being the command bar, that doesn't mean too much. As long as there isn't any red in the efficiency bar, you're usually good. So now, onto the unit types themselves. I'll open up a second division real fast here, so I can show you just what they are. The first type of unit is the infantry, and unless you're doing some form of self-imposed challenge, it will also be the most common. Infantry units can go anywhere from 500 to 2500 men, I will need more points into army organization skill for the larger sizes, however. They tend to move slowly and turn even slower, though their actual turning speed is heavily dependent on their size. But they also tend to do more damage per volley than any other comparatively sized unit, so long as they have equipment, training, and that the comparatively sized unit isn't a battery of close range 24 pound howitzers. The second type is artillery. These are measured in guns rather than men, although it's a direct ratio. One gun requires 25 men to operate. Their goal is to fire at extreme range to soften targets up at a distance, and since they are indirect weapons, are the only unit that can ignore line of sight blocking and fire through, or I suppose more accurately over, other units. I'll get to the cavalry in a sec. Next up is the skirmishers. They tend to fall into two types. One is the sniper form of skirmisher, which uses a long-range weapon to hit enemy troops from outside of return fire range, and the other type I call a light infantry skirmisher, which uses guns that tend to be shorter range than infantry, 
but have a high fire rate and is designed for harassment and flanking strikes. Utilizing the fact that skirmishers normal movement speed is the same as infantry's sprinting speed. Both types of skirmishers enjoy increased spotting and stealth compared to normal infantry, and when in heavy forest or housing, can often not be spotted by opposing forces until they are already inside their firing range. Also, skirmishers take far less damage in general, which is the game's way of representing that they don't line up in packed rows like normal infantry, and they gain extra benefit from cover compared to infantry. And lastly is cavalry. There are actually two definitions of cavalry depending on which type of weapon they are given. Shock cavalry, which specializes in melee combat, often using weapons with ranges so short they are only good for firing at enemy troops right before the sabers come out, and skirmish cavalry, which sport weapons similar to the light infantry skirmishers I mentioned earlier. The two types each have their own icon. Melee cav are pretty self-explanatory. Skirmish cav, while certainly okay at melee charging, are more specialized in acting like light infantry skirmishers, running around at horseback speeds to try and get beside or behind targets, sometimes firing then retreating, other times getting into position and then dismounting. Skirmish cavalry can dismount from their horses and act, functionally, identical to a skirmisher. The downsides to skirmish cavalry, compared to normal skirmishers, is that the cavalry version is more expensive, especially noticeable when a high-level cavalry group tries to use veterans to replace losses, as well as the micromanagement necessary to use them effectively. If any cavalry gets shot at while mounted, their casualties will be way worse than any skirmisher, or for that matter, any infantry brigade. I will demonstrate skirmish cavalry and dismounting next video. So with the basic unit explanations out of the way, how large should one make their army? That's a matter of some debate, but there is one major aspect of the game that should be known when deciding it. Most units have a size where, regardless of commander's skill, they will start actually losing damage if they pass it. Not just the case where each additional, say, cannon is less effective than the previous one, but actually the case where adding more cannons reduces the entire battery's output. I have all the research links in the video description, but I'm going to pop up an image here. These choices were made by the devs for, I have to assume, game balance reasons. Now I'm not going to make a comment on whether this makes any sense. Okay, I'll make one comment, this doesn't really make any sense. But it's still the case that this is how it is, and therefore something that should be planned for when creating an effective army in an unmodded game. Does this mean that you should only ever make units these sizes? Hardly. I can certainly come up with situations where going over these numbers are useful, and as I get to the point in the game where I even have the ability to bring my infantry brigades over 1500, I'll discuss those reasons in more depth. But until then, keeping these numbers in mind is a good idea, especially with the cannons. Since not only does two 12 cannon batteries fare far better than a single 24 cannon battery, but a single 12 cannon battery is also way better than a 24 sized one, and with only half the cost in manpower, material, and supplies. And lastly, leader bonuses and what they are. Every brigade has a commander. Well, every brigade will have a commander once I've replaced everyone that got gunned over, but you know what I mean. The commander's experience gets combined to the unit's overall experience, and then that gets applied as a bonus to the unit's statistics. Also, the commander's rank and experience determine how large a unit can be before it starts suffering efficiency penalties. All in all, a very important position. Then, there are divisional commanders. A division commander has exactly two functions. First is if you decide to combine multiple brigades on the battlefield into one large brigade, the division commander will take over as the leader of said combo brigade. There is a real good chance that I will not be doing that at any part in this series, so that's basically a non-factor. The other function is that he gives a bonus to the command rating of each brigade under him, allowing those brigades to be slightly larger without suffering an efficiency penalty. But that's it. That's all he does. So unless you are big on battlefield combinations, or accidentally making your brigades larger than the brigade commanders can handle, he's almost pointless. Almost. As the minimum rank for division commander is colonel, I tend to always have those positions filled by colonels 
so I can have my generals in more active roles. And finally, there are corps commanders, with a minimum rank of brigadier general. A corps commander gets up to three perks, one at brigadier general, two at major general, and three at lieutenant general, that get applied to the brigades under his command. Sort of. The third perk only applies to any unit that is currently within his circular command radius. Also, unlike divisional and brigade commanders, the corps commander's experience within his current rank isn't used, just the rank itself. So when deciding who to put in charge of what, it's most often best to put your highest level generals in charge of corps, though if you have more generals than corps, having the generals with the lowest amount of experience in their rank taking the corps roles, your lowest experience colonels in the divisional command spots, and everyone else in a brigade leadership position. As for who gets which brigade, that's largely up to you. The more a unit sees action, the more that unit's leader can apply his bonuses to the conflict. But at the same time, the more fire a unit takes, the more likely it is that the leader will be injured or killed. And so, with all the mechanics out of the way, let's prepare for the next stage. There are two choices for the next battle. The Grand Battle of First Bull Run, or the Side Battle of Newport News. Whenever a Grand Battle is played, any outstanding side battles are closed off. So if you want to play everything, you basically need to hit every side battle the instant it becomes available. Which is what I'll be doing. So Newport News it is. I'll hold off on narrating the battle until I actually do the video for it. This battle will involve a single core, which is fine since I only have one, and as well, even within that core, I'm only going to be able to bring three brigades. So while there is much discussion on whether wide or tall armies are better, for this fight I need to make sure I bring three good, solid brigades. So let's do that. First, a quick trick to get a few extra high-ranking officers. You may have noticed that I could create a new division if I want to, and if I try to, one of the two colonels that is available in the academy is chosen to be hired as the leader. But let's not do that. Instead, let's hire the two colonels from the barracks and assign them to the vacated roles in my two leaderless brigades. Now let's try to make a new division. And here you'll notice a brand new colonel with no experience and costing this much being created to fill the role. Let's do it! Sadly, I can't pull the same trick for the already existing but vacated division, but at least I managed to gain an extra colonel for later. So let's replace the less experienced colonel with a reserve officer so we can move the colonel to the division. And with that done, let's go back into the reputation menu to pick up the general and some 1841 Mississippis. This does give me a negative 2 morale penalty, but at this point in the game, a larger, better led, better equipped trio of brigades is more useful than those 2 morale points. Let's put the general in charge of the infantry, and the now displaced officer back in charge of the other infantry unit. Take both infantry, replenish their manpower up to 700, and give them those new guns. I'm using rookies for all of this because while it does drop my abilities somewhat, it's still so early in the game that the opposing forces aren't much better. Add the five cannons I recovered from the first fight to the three already in the battery and choose their perk. I'll describe all the perk choices in more detail as I'm actually able to apply them to my units, but for right now, just know that this choice is bugged. If you are playing an unmodded game, don't choose the ammunition perk. Drop some extra cash into our supply wagon, and we're looking good. Before I end the video, I want to make mention of one aspect of the game, the way it tries to maintain difficulty in lieu of a player's successes or failures. Every stage, the amount of troops the enemy will field is highly dependent on this number, but another factor goes into what the enemy will field, the size of your army, both in terms of total troop count and number of brigades and not just the ones you'll be bringing to the fight, every single assigned troop and brigade you have will be counted. The side effect of this is that some enterprising players have developed a method to use the computer's own dynamic difficulty against it. The idea is to make an entire core filled with the maximum possible number of infantry brigades, 
and each brigade having the minimum number of possible troops. By owning a full corps of these affectionately named ballast brigades, your average brigade size will be smaller, and the AI uses that in its own dynamic difficulty calculations. The end result is that each enemy brigade is smaller than it would be otherwise, so you can effectively enlarge your own army and directly shrink the enemies. And having said all that, I will not be making any such ballast units. Then again, I'm also not playing on legendary difficulty, so if you are, I'll leave it to you to decide if you want to use this method. I may be making units that I don't field, but they won't be minimum sized. They'll be used due to a side effect of how the medicine talent works, but I'll get more into that much later when it becomes relevant. This interaction between your army and the enemy's size is why I didn't just max out my three brigades. I had both the money and reserve manpower to make two 1500 man infantry brigades backed up by a 14 cannon battery, but if I did that, most of the enemy's brigades next stage would also be buffed up considerably. And as we will already be outnumbered in the coming fight, that outnumbering being inflated would be undesirable. But I'm getting ahead of myself. A full explanation of the next stage will have to wait until the video of the next stage. I'm episodic like that. Save the game, and next time, the newly refurbished army will go out for a spin.